Thank you very much. It's a tough act to follow. I don't know about you, but I'm going to go right back to my room after this and brush my teeth. <laughs> so these are my disclosures. I'm going to talk about the unique issues for in the management of women with von Willebrand disease and why talk specifically about women while they are disproportionately affected by von Willebrand disease due to the challenges of menstruation and child both. Both situations where bleeding is normal but sometimes hard to distinguish in a patient with von Willebrand disease what is the intersection of normal and excessive and in what situations can the bleeding be attributed to von Willebrand disease. Eric von Willebrand noted that twice as many females were affected as males and that is still true. In published series of patients with von Willebrand disease, uh, by symptom, heavy menstrual bleeding or menorrhagia was reported in anywhere from 32 to 100 percent of the women with von Willebrand disease. So among women, heavy menstrual bleeding is the most common symptom that they will experience. To manage heavy menstrual bleeding, though, even though we might attribute this to low levels of von Willebrand factor, we start with the target organ, the uterus, and treat it. Our gynecologic treatments include surgery, but first and foremost, hormonal treatment. And we start by asking, would the patient like to preserve fertility? And if the answer is yes, would the patient like to become pregnant now? If yes, then we'll come up with a treatment plan in conjunction with an expert in hemostasis. We need treatment that does not suppress ovulation, her ability to become pregnant. Some of you have heard my story of the patient who came to me after being married and for two years could not conceive. And after a careful history, I said it could be the birth control pill she was taking. She <clears throat> said, but she wasn't taking them for that reason. It didn't matter. They, were, they had another purpose in mind, and they were affecting it. So if she, but we have other ways to control heavy menstrual bleeding in that situation with uh, antifibrinolytics, tranexamic acid, or desmopressin uh, when the patient's a candidate so we can help the patient who has heavy menstrual bleeding and needs heavy menstrual bleeding controlled to achieve fertility, we can help her with that. Uh, if she does, wants to preserve fertility but does not want to become pregnant now, we can use hormonal measures. We can use those birth control pills. Uh, we can use the levonorgestrel intrauterine device. 90% of the IUDs placed in the United States are the levonorgestrel intrauterine device. Regardless of whether the patient has an underlying bleeding disorder, it's a progestin impregnated intrauterine device that reduces uh, the amount of lining that's built up and reduces the amount of heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, the third option is progestin-only contraceptives, uh, progestin pills, Depo-Provera injections, uh, intrauterine devices, or uh, subcutaneous implants. For the patient, though, who has, uh, has no desire for future fertility, she should be considered a candidate for endometrial ablation, which is destruction of the lining of the uterus, or a hysterectomy. These are data from Vanessa Byams uh, and colleagues that were published in hemophilia. These are data collected by the Centers for Disease Control, Women's uh, Uniform Data Collection, or UDC, uh, pilot project looking at what methods to control heavy menstrual bleeding were used among participants in the centers. The number one method was combined hormonal contraceptive or oral contraceptives. Other gynecologic treatments that were used were endometrial ablation in 4.2 percent, the levonorgestrel IUD and uterine artery embolization. Where there are no data specifically 
in its use to manage heavy menstrual bleeding outside of the, uh, in women with, who also have uh, fibroids of their uterus, but it has been used uh, in a couple of cases here. The hemostatic treatments included desmopressin, antifibrinolytics, blood or plasma products, which would also comprise clotting factor products and a platelet transfusion. Uh, 21 out of 198 or 10.6% of menstruating or menopausal women with heavy menstrual bleeding underwent hysterectomy specifically to control heavy menstrual bleeding. We, uh, our group used the nationwide inpatient sample, a discharge database for the United States to look at what are the complications of hysterectomy because in a woman for whom it's her only symptom, it is potentially curative. We looked at all the uh, cases uh, of hysterectomy without von Willebrand disease and compared it to the women with von Willebrand disease. And we found that women with von Willebrand disease were more likely to have transfusion, bleeding complications, and a longer length of stay, a higher cost, and, uh, but no significant increased risk of death. And perhaps these are risks worth taking. The other situation where women are at increased risk of hemorrhagic complications besides their menstrual period is miscarriage, but particularly childbirth. So most hemostasis centers will try to put a plan in place to manage child, uh, to reduce the risk of bleeding at the time of childbirth. We are helped by the fact that levels of von Willebrand factor and levels of factor VIII increase in pregnancy. These are data from Jill Johnson's lab at the University of Washington in the United States. Here we see the levels of antigen rising. This is childbirth and declining quickly afterwards. The levels of factor VIII increasing and the levels of von Willebrand factor increasing. These are data from a multi-center study that we coordinated at our institution. These are levels in postpartum von Willebrand factor and factor VIII uh, in women with and without von Willebrand disease. And you can see at every time, and these are days after delivery, you can see that by week three, levels are back down to baseline levels, but at every time point, women with von Willebrand disease had lower levels than women uh, who were not affected. These levels were among women who had type 1 von Willebrand disease, who had, whose von Willebrand factor levels had increased to above 50 during pregnancy and were not considered at risk for requiring treatment. Here we have in red the women who actually required treatment, and you can see that despite treatment, their levels were generally lower than either their unaffected peers or the peers who didn't require treatment. And there are multiple reports of hemorrhage occurring after women are discharged from the hospital, what we would call secondary postpartum hemorrhage after the first 24 hours postpartum. We looked at menstrual ble or lochial bleeding, I should say, the recorded on pads after delivery. And this is in green, this is by week, and in green is women without von Willebrand disease. In blue is women with von Willebrand disease, but who were not deemed requiring treatment. In other words, their levels at the time of delivery were greater than 50%. And in red is the recorded pad scores among women who required treatment for von Willebrand disease and had levels less than 50%. And you can see that after week three, they had significantly higher pad scores than their unaffected peers or those who were untreated with von Willebrand disease, suggesting that these, are, these women are potentially inadequately treated or uh, can otherwise at risk for heavy menstrual bleeding. I'm just, I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, but these were the treatment regimens among the 15 women with 17 pregnancies who were incorporated into our study of postpartum von Willebrand disease, every treatment regimen was different. 
treatment regimens lasted from zero to 21 days after delivery, included continuous or bolus infusions, uh, and in some cases none or only desmopressin prior to delivery. So there really isn't any consensus on what is the best treatment after childbirth. But in planning for pregnancy, ideally planning should begin before conception. Women contemplating a pregnancy should be aware that they may be at increased risk of bleeding complications during pregnancy and are definitely at an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. And prior to conception or during pregnancy, they should be an offer an opportunity to speak with a genetic counselor regarding the inheritance of von Willebrand disease and a pediatric hematologist regarding the evaluation of the infant after delivery. And in terms of management of childbirth, women with type 1 von Willebrand disease with levels equal to or greater than 50 and no history of severe bleeding probably do not require any special treatment at the time of delivery, but those with type 3, type 2, or von Will type 1 with levels less than 50 or a history of severe bleeding should be referred for prenatal care and delivery to a center where, in addition to specialists in high-risk obstetrics, there is a hemophilia treatment center and or, and or a specialist, uh, a hematologist with expertise in hemostasis. So in summary, women with von Willebrand's disease are disproportionately affected due to the challenges of menstruation and childbirth. Heavy menstrual bleeding is the most common bleeding symptom women with von Willebrand disease experience. First-line therapy for heavy menstrual bleeding is hormonal therapy. Hemostatic therapy is required for treatment failures or for women trying to become pregnant. Hysterectomy is an option for women who have completed childbearing and is relatively safe. But women with type 2, 3, or type 1 with levels less than 50 or a history of hemorrhage should give birth in a specialized center. For more information, I'd refer you to uh, the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders website. The foundation's dedicated to educating obstetrician gynecologists around the unique uh, needs of women with blood disorders and educating hematologists about reproductive issues. So I want to thank you very much for our attention.